Today's video is actually a precursor to a subsequent video that will come out at some point probably, maybe not, who knows. And in this video, I'm gonna be making a switch box to switch 240 volts at 30 amps between two different outputs. And you'll have to wait for the video that features it to see why I'm doing this. But uh, let me show you what we got here real quick. All right, so here I've got three four by four square boxes, standard work boxes. I've got a double gang switch plate and two plates for the NEMA L630R receptacles that are going to go in these. And over here I have a power cord which already has an L630P on it and then just bare copper on the other end and it is uh, 15 feet. So this will be the power inlet for these boxes and these boxes are all going to be joined together in order to form one big box, one mega box, which is going to have these two plates like this and then this plate like that. And the idea being that this switch will turn on this receptacle and this switch will turn on this receptacle. Oh, I should note in case you're wondering, yes, I have two microphones. I'm trying out a new microphone, but in case it sucks, I want to have my old microphone still there so that it actually captures the audio as usual. And I don't have to worry about it if the other one, well, craps out or just has a lot of static or whatever happens. So I can still listen to this entire recording and make sure the audio is okay on that mic but if it's not, use the original mic for the actual audio for this video, if that makes it clear. And then to populate those boxes, we've got 30 amp double pole heavy duty switches, two of them, of course, and we also have the, the L630Rs. And for those of you who are not familiar, these are standard twist lock connectors, um, standard in the US anyway, and they are single phase, kind of. I mean, if you looked at it in an oscilloscope, you'd see two phases, but in the US, we're on a single phase system. Like, I mean, if you want to start an argument, like we're a single phase system in the US, don't ever question that. But if you look at the output of one of these receptacles on an oscilloscope from live to live or from line to line, you'll see two different sine waves that are 180 degrees opposite from each other, almost as if it's two phases, but never call it a two phase system because it's not. And I wanted to be a little pedantic here. From the perspective of the entire distribution system, yes, it's a single phase that feeds my house. But from the perspective of me inside my house with theoretically no knowledge of what's going on outside of my house, for all intents and purposes, it's a two phase system because I can see two phases with an oscilloscope and I can probe it and everything, that, everything in the house appears to be two phase. But really it's just two taps off a transformer 180 degrees apart that makes it look like two phases. So it's not really a two phase system by and large, but it kind of has two phases, but it doesn't really. It's not two phases from the generator. It's two phases from the transformer, which isn't really two phases. I get it. I actually did another video that explains it a bit more clearly about how 240 volts is the standard household voltage in the United States, not 120. 120 is just half the voltage available in the house. So in most homes and apartments. But anyway, watch that video if you're curious. Um, in this video, I'll just be covering assembling some crap and putting it together. And then one more thing is, of course, the wire that I'll be using inside of these boxes. This feeder wire is, of course, uh, 10 gauge, which is appropriate for 30 amps, which is what this entire thing would be rated for. But I'm going to be using 12 gauge wire in the boxes, which is, which seems silly, but first of all, I'm never going to be loading this with 30 amps. That's one thing I want you to understand. This, this is just gonna be a piece of test equipment for my own purposes to use probably for one video. So the lower gauge wire is not an issue. Also, I would consider this to be panel wiring because it's not building wiring because it's not fixed in the building. And this is gonna be kind of a panel in some sense. I don't know if uh, the NEC would agree with me. That's the National Electric Code. But for my purposes, for a piece of test equipment, I think 12 gauge wire internally is gonna be fine also for just ease of wiring 12 gauge is just easier to work with than 10 gauge it's kind of a cop out i'll admit but like i said this is a piece of test equipment that's actually going to have almost no load on it when i test it out so uh it really doesn't matter i mean i could be using like friggin 16 gauge wire and for my intents and purposes it wouldn't matter so before anyone gets all upset yes this is thin wire it's technically too thin but i think it's fine for this one purpose all right, so I think the first step here is just going to be join these three boxes together, and I'm not going to use anything fancy for that. 
this is what I'm going to use. It's not the right thing for the job, but it will meet the boxes together. And I'm going to use four of them, two between each of the, each of the two boxes. So the first thing I got to do is knock out some knockouts, which is going to be loud. And also this table is not very strong. So I'm going to do that on the floor. So I'll be right back in a second. These are the knockouts to which I'm, refer I'm referring, by the way. And uh, before anyone asks, no, I'm not an electrician. I'm not a hobbyist electrician. I do like electrical projects. This is not a permanent building installation. Like I said, this is a piece of test equipment for one demonstration. So uh, if anything is not completely up to snuff, please forgive me. It's not my area of training. That being said, this should be relatively safe especially with the almost no load that I'm going to be putting on it. There's actually no reason to have the cable retention on these uh, for this occasion. Because I'm just using these as mechanical connectors. And pass through for the wiring. Okay, there we go. All three boxes joined up and it's a relatively solid assembly. All right, next step, I'm gonna put the bonding screws in. And even though these three boxes are fairly well bonded to each other right now by those uh, nuts, I'm still going to actually do the belt and suspenders method of actually bonding every single box. And if it bothers anyone's OCD, it's bothering mine that I actually have this box upside down, but whatever, it doesn't matter from an electrical standpoint. It just matters from an OCD standpoint. Oh, and I forgot, I need one more knockout knocked out for the uh, incoming cable. So one moment, please. Actually, I'm going to have to find a cable gland that's the appropriate size for this. So let me, so let me remove this from its packaging and see what I can see. I actually didn't check ahead of time. I'm hoping I have cable glands that are big enough for this, well, cable. No, not quite. Oh wait, these are even bigger, I believe. Oh yeah. It's kind of a tight fit, but it'll work, I believe. Yep, that'll work. Of course it's backwards, but I'm just test fitting it. Okay, well I'm back. I had to remount this hole slightly because uh, the knockout was just a little bit too small. I think these are sized in metric. And this is, of course, sized in Imperial, but now that fits uh, quite nicely. And if you notice any moisture, I mean, I think I dried it off pretty well. But if you notice any moisture on these boxes, uh, I washed it afterwards just to get any metal shavings out of here. Because metal shavings is that floating around is, well, worse than a bit of water in it right now. Because that water will dry rather quickly. And the metal shavings could rattle around in there and, you know, get into the switch contacts or somewhere where they really shouldn't be. All these switches are probably pretty well sealed, but at any rate, metal shavings floating around in your device is quite undesirable. Okay, that's pretty solidly on there. I mean, it's a plastic nut, so it's as solid as it'll ever get. Now, these can be short. I can stub them out. I actually have some brand new wago lever nut connectors and uh, i'm going to be using these inside because these are rated for both the 10 gauge stranded and the 12 gauge solid copper and it's a far easier thing to make up than using wire nuts and these are properly rated uh, these are genuine wago they're not a knockoff there's tons of knockoffs out there so just watch out for those if you're trying to do a serious electrical installation but anyway i'm going to split off uh, the live neutral and ground immediately immediately after entering the box. And the only thing I'm not sure about, yeah, there's, there's a strip gauge on here. So I gotta strip these down just a little more. And with that tightened down, if this is an effective connection, I should be able to pull this pretty hard without the wires actually moving. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite nice. All right, I'm just gonna stick Wago connectors right on the ends of these for now. Okay, and first I'll take care of the grounding wire. 
or grounding wires as the case may be here. And I just need a very short stub for this first box because the switches, I don't think, have grounding connectors. And, oh, they do actually, but there's also self-grounding. They have this little brass piece in the front, which gives them a good electrical contact to the faceplate. And moreover, there's really nothing exposed on the switch that's going to uh, have a risk of electric shock because the entire front of this is going to be metal anyway. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to ground the, the switches individually, but I will ground the receptacles, of course. I'm an idiot. I do need a, uh, a four-way on that one. But I only have a five-way, so the five-way is going to be used for the ground, which is fine. And then for grounding the receptacles, what I'm going to do is leave a good length of wire sticking on the end, and I'm just going to leave a small exposed section, which is going to go around the grounding terminal in there. So this will loop around the screw there, and then ultimately this will go to the receptacle. All right, there we go. Maybe I should have left this a bit longer, but on the other one, I'll, uh, I'll add some more slack to it. Always better too long than too short, I guess. Okay, and now all three boxes are bonded to ground via this Wago connector to each of these grounding terminals or bonding screws. And that's probably overkill because these boxes do have a pretty decent electrical connection to each other. These are pretty, are clamped down pretty tight and biting into the metal. But, uh, you know, overkill on grounding is always better than underkill, in my opinion. I'm an idiot. I don't know why I pulled white wire for a neutral. There is no neutral in here. Um, that was just like a brain fart on my part. And also because there is a white wire here, which I actually have to recolor so that it's uh, not labeled as a neutral anymore because this is not going to be neutral. That uh, is not really how this wire should be labeled because this is for a 240 volt circuit where both of these are live. So my, my apologies for the uh, mix up. And I thought these were interesting because they have a sort of like inverted tip, which is meant to go around a wire in order to mark it with the color, which, uh, it's working in a mediocre fashion. Oh no, there it goes. Cool. And I'll just get it on all sides. As best as possible. There we go. And if you're in Europe, you're probably horrified because I just colored the neutral wire blue, which indicates that it's neutral when it's not, when I'm telling you it's a live wire. Uh, but in the US, pretty much any color except green, gray, or white can be used for a live conductor. And blue is probably the third most common color for a live conductor after black and red. And I just decided not to use red because I pulled out a spool of blue wire and a spool of yellow wire, both of which can indicate live in the US. And that's just to, uh, I'll just use them to differentiate uh, for fun. They could have pulled black, but I think yellow just has a little more, I don't know, joie de vivre to it. Now, before I start wiring up the switches, I'm going to put this mud ring on. This was a bit of a silly thing in that I couldn't find a like double gang switch plate of the mud ring style. So we're just going to mount the switches to this mud ring, which just sits proud of the box a little bit. And then uh, I have a metal cover plate that's arguably oversized for the job. This is actually a decorative cover plate, but uh, that was the best I could do at the Home Depot at the time. And it'll be more than safe and more than adequate for these purposes. The other benefit and the other reason why I grabbed the blue and the yellow cable or the blue and the yellow wire is because it's stranded instead of solid, which just makes life a little bit easier bending it inside these boxes. Okay, 
switch is wired up and ready to be put in the box and we'll just wire up the other one and then I'll put them both in roughly at the same time. All right, both switches are wired up and now we can attach the two live conductors and then for each of them and then seat them in place. All right, switches are in place. And just give it a quick inspection. Make sure none of the wires came out of the Wago connectors or none of the Wago connectors popped open, which of course they shouldn't, but you know, can't hurt to take a look. Make sure that none of the terminals are shorting out against something random. Nope, we got plenty of clearance. Everything's looking good with these switches. So now on to the receptacles, which is the last and easiest part. And usually I'll use the drill to fire the screw in most of the way and then just hand torque it down just to make sure it's not like, you know, gonna strip this threads out or anything or it's not torqued down too hard, but that's uh, fine. So there we go, we got one receptacle. The cover plate for the switches has to go on last because it's gonna overlap the receptacle cover plate a little bit. Why would they put the barcode overlapping the hole? That's just dumb. Like, not a major problem, just sort of silly. All right, two receptacles are ready to go. And now just the uh, cover plate for the switches. All right, and there we have it. One power distribution unit with a switch for each receptacle, which hopefully I got the one on the right connected to the one on the right and the one on the left to the one on the left. I'm pretty sure I did though. And uh, in this video, I'm not gonna power this up because that would kind of ruin the surprise of the next video, but I am going to at least continuity test it to make sure that everything's wired the way it should be. And even do an insulation breakdown test on it just to make sure there's no potential crossover between like either of the, well, quote unquote phases and or ground. So first let me get the old multimeter. Here is the Bryman BM869S which I'm going to put into continuity mode. Wonderful. So, as you can see, we got continuity that way. And then, I believe this should be the ground. Yep, or at least I hope that, is, that should be the ground. So we got good ground continuity to all the uh, boxes and to the correct holes in the receptacles. Now for the two line conductors. So this is the wider of the two slots. That has continuity, that has continuity. Make sure it doesn't have continuity to ground or the smaller of the slots. Smaller slot, ground, okay. And if we turn the switches off, of course, we should have no continuity anywhere. Yep, perfect. And then test the smaller of the two. Continuity, continuity, and then just make sure there's no continuity anywhere else. And then once again, if we turn the switches off, no continuity. Great. So as far as it being wired together properly, that seems good. Um, just one more test. I mean, even though I already kind of tested to see if it was cross-connected, we'll just make sure there's no continuity between any of these pins. Because that would indicate a dead short, which would be quite a bad thing. So we don't appear to have a dead short. That's good. And now let me get one more piece of equipment. This is the Socket NC insulation continuity tester, or a mega, as some people call it, I believe. So what we simply don't want to see is any sort of continuity. This will test up to, uh, I think, 500 volts. 
Yeah, this will test up to five by passing up to 500 volts through whatever these clamps are on, including a person if you're not careful, though at a very low current. So I'm just connecting it to two of the pins on here, and these should have no continuity under you know any reasonable voltage up to you know of course 500 volts. Okay, let's do an insulation test. We're set to 500 volts. Greater than 999 mega ohms, which is what you want to see. That means there's no continuity at all in any reasonable sense of the word. So then I'm going to leave the black clamp where it is on that terminal and just move the red clamp to the other terminal. Now, of course, I'm not touching the boxes themselves. I'm just touching this device. Okay, once again, great. And then I just didn't test it between these two. So let's get on that and test. Greater than 999, perfect. So even at 500 volts, we have no breakdown on any of the insulation. We have no stray whiskers of wire that are arcing. Everything seems fine. So I think uh, this thing has passed the tests and it's ready to be plugged in to the wall. And then on the other end, something else will be plugged into here where I will turn these on and off to demonstrate its functionality. So if you can guess what it is, I suppose leave it in the comments below. See if you're right later. It's not a contest. It's just, you know, you could say, haha, I told you so. And that's fun. Everyone likes that. So uh, thanks for watching. I've been Scott. This has been a weird electrical contraption. And uh, yeah, um, like and subscribe and blah, 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 blah. Oh, also, um, if anyone cares, I have a, another channel called Scott.Extras, which is linked on my main channel page. And that's where I host a bunch of crap that never should have been a video in the first place. But I'm also going to, and I, well, a while ago I started doing live streams, but I'm going to start trying to do that more seriously and build stuff like this in a live stream so that people can interact with me and talk to me. So anyway, uh, Scott.Extras. Scott dot space extras. Well, it's on the screen. You can see what I mean. I don't have it on the screen right now, but you do because you're watching the edited version of this, which I am not because this is live for me. It's live for me, edited for you and not streamed at all in this case, but I was considering streaming it and I will stream crap like this eventually. So I've talked way too long. Um, have a good night. <laughs> who, does, who does this at the end of a YouTube video? <laughs> It's not the kids, not the queen coming to visit. Do people do this to the queen? I don't even know. If you're from the UK, where you have a queen, or anywhere you have a queen, uh, let me know if you do that to the queen when she leaves or whatever. Um, anyway, bye. Yeah. Okay.